Hello, viewers. Thank you for joining me. Next on my list of shows I've been meaning to get to for a while is 91 Days. Personally, nothing gets me invested faster than a murder mystery. This wasn't one of those anime where I needed the little details to convince me to watch it, but I definitely can't get into this one without mentioning those details, because 91 Days has a really unique setting. I don't think I've ever come across another anime that takes place in the Chicago area in the 1920s. 91 Days is the kind of show where the setting defines everything. 1920 to 1933 is known as the Prohibition Era, where it was illegal to buy alcohol in the United States. Not that these laws stopped many people. There was a booming black market for the stuff. And in areas like Chicago, where the Italian Mafia was already strong, they basically took over that black market, making them even more powerful, wealthy, and influential. Our story takes place in Lawless, a smaller city not far from Chicago, whose underground is run by the Venetti Mafia family. At least, it is now. Our story really starts seven years earlier, when Vincent Venetti was first taking over, overthrowing the previous Don. In order to do so, he had to take out Don Moreno's right-hand man, Testa Lagusa, just to be safe, he and a small group of his closest supporters decided to ambush and kill the entire Lagusa family, but Testa's older son Angelo gets away that night, in no small part because Vincent's son Nero couldn't bring himself to shoot him, and that's what sets this whole story in motion. Helped at first by his best friend Corteo, Angelo manages to get out of the city, but seven years later, he receives a letter from a suspiciously unnamed man claiming to be his father's best friend. This letter names three of the men who were there that night. He'll later find out there was a fourth man who predictably turns out to be the letter's writer. But Angelo isn't swayed by how shady this whole situation is. Though he survived, it hasn't been much of a life. Angelo spent the past seven years thinking of nothing but revenge for his family. So he reconnects with Corteo, who's been brewing his own alcohol, trying to save up money to go to college, probably start up some respectable business someday. Corteo's really a too-good-for-this-world type of character. He's also alone, having lost his mother to some unspecified illness. He was quick to offer a hand to Angelo after he lost his family, telling him he already saw the two of them as brothers, and he's the type to do anything he can to help a brother. Even if that means using his homebrew to get in with the Venettis, something Corteo's been passionate about not doing, not wanting to work with any of the mob families, having seen what they're capable of, but he agrees to it to help Angelo who takes on the alias Avilio as he starts to work his way into the Venetti family inner circle. Which he manages in record time. I try to stick to the big picture when writing reviews to avoid making the story sound really convoluted. 91 Days is one of those series where a lot is getting edited out. The Venetti family was already a mess before Angelo slipped in. The Galassia family, who run Chicago, are the real big shots. All the smaller families do whatever they can to stay on their good side, because no one has the power to stand up to them should the Galassia start to see them as competition. But during their very first meeting, Angelo and Corteo walk into the turf war between the Venetis and one of the other smaller gangs in the area, the Orcos. Through some quick reflexes and quick thinking, Angelo manages to save Nero Venetti's life, for what certainly won't be the last time, and being an outsider soon works in his favor, as it's revealed there's trouble within the family as well. Nero's the oldest son, and thus the heir, but he's always been a bit of a troublemaker, too. On the other hand, Nero's younger brother, Frate, has always been quick to do whatever their father asks of him, yet Nero's the one who gets all the respect. So Frate's been plotting with the Galassias, who Nero's never wanted to work with, to usurp his brother's position in the family, and he uses this other turf war as cover, knowing the assassin he sends after his brother will be blamed on the Orco family. But Nero's got a good number of loyal friends within the family who advise him that all may not be what it seems. Wanting to keep him safe until those suspicions can be proven, Nero leaves town, taking his new friend Avilio with him. Okay, 
Everyone still with me? This is what I meant about this story very quickly becoming convoluted and confusing to a blind viewer. I don't expect anyone with no experience with the show to perfectly follow all these family relationships and betrayals, because I definitely struggled with it at first. It's the type of story with a lot of characters getting killed off just as I was starting to remember their names or recognize them in a crowd. And that definitely contributed to how I struggled to get into this one a little bit. It wasn't until about episode 5, when the series is almost half over, that I felt I was really sucked in and excited to move on to each new episode. There are a few reasons for that, and I feel there's an important distinction that needs to be made. 91 Days doesn't have a lot of what I consider to be objective flaws. You know, mistakes in the storytelling, or plot points that get forgotten, or characters suddenly acting out of character for the sake of moving the story along. I think it's very well told, and everything feels intentional. But I have to admit, mafia stories really aren't my thing. It tends to be a lot of men in suits plotting betrayal in fancy restaurants, men in suits shooting at each other in dark alleys. They just struggle to hold my attention. That's true of any movie or show that's really visually dark, even without the barely distinguishable men in suits. Which is why I first started getting really invested during this impromptu road trip. It's where you start to really get to know Nero, who is fairly charming and likable from the beginning, and I sympathized a bit with Frate, too. His character was this whole separate journey I hadn't been expecting. When Nero's younger brother is first introduced, he seems naive and incompetent, like someone who's been wealthy and pampered his whole life and is only getting by in a cutthroat organization like this through nepotism. Then his plot to usurp his brother is revealed, and he comes across as the despicable kind of cunning, someone who has to resort to underhanded tactics because he's not strong or brave enough to fight his problems head on. But I found myself warming up to him as I got to the heart of his trouble with Nero. There's the personal aspect of it. I think most of us can relate to that frustration, watching someone succeed when you don't feel they deserve it. But there are bigger ideals at stake here. The Galassia run everything, and Nero and Frate are at odds over how that should be handled. Nero prioritizes pride. Working with the Galassias is as good as just letting them take over. What's the point of having this little empire they've built if it's not really theirs? And Frate prioritizes survival. They're not strong enough to fight the bigger family. If they don't work with them, they'll have nothing. And I'm sure the counter-argument would be that having no freedom is the same as having nothing. Their differing views are what really got me into this story. I like arguments where I can't quite bring myself to pick a side. There's merit to both of them. And while this is happening, Angelo is getting Nero to open up about the night they killed the Lagusa family, his first real job, which was really a make-or-break moment for Nero for me. He doesn't get super emotional about it, or approve of killing the innocent family members. It seems to be the event that taught him that sometimes this lifestyle will come with necessary evils, and I think everyone needs to be judged individually on those occasions. And for Nero, who was 14 at the time and being led along by everyone he trusted most, who was born into this life where betrayal would have meant his own death, we can safely say that I have no trouble forgiving his involvement. And I'll also admit that this forgiveness may have been influenced, just a little, by the fact that Nero is the far more likable of our two main leads. Which finally brings us to Angelo. He's kind of a rough spot in the show for me. Like, I sympathize with his traumatic past, and his motivations make sense, but I also kind of don't care, as bad as I know that sounds. 91 Days has a really great opening, the kind of opening that I definitely think could sell someone on watching this show even if they knew nothing else about it, but it also highlighted a problem I had with our not-so-lovable main character. He shows more emotion in that minute and a half than he does in almost 12 whole episodes, and I mean, 
I respect that he's very smart and driven. Angelo Lagus is the type of character who gets shit done. But I need more than a character being cool. I need a character I can feel for. So yeah, the fact that Angelo never really second-guesses himself or wavers in his goals also impacted my enjoyment a bit. His undercover operation with the Venetis drags him to a point where he's just as bad as the people he wants revenge on. When a revenge-obsessed character can't even claim the moral high ground, that's another rough point. But like I said before, I don't think his moral failings are a failure of the writing. My anime list has this one labeled as an action and a drama, but I would definitely classify it as a tragedy, too. A tragedy I'm really trying not to spoil. 91 Days' ending isn't a happy one, but it is satisfying in a strange, dark way. Nero gets his freedom, though at a terrible price, and there's really only one character I wanted better for. But his conclusion and the way he got there showed a strength of character I really respected, too. More storytelling that I didn't particularly enjoy, but which was satisfying all the same. And sometimes I think that's the best advertisement a show can receive. There was so much about this series that wouldn't usually appeal to me, but it turned out to be a really impressive story. The kind where enjoyment almost doesn't matter because the writing is just that good. The 91 Days creators clearly had a vision in mind for their story, and they succeeded in bringing it to life. That's something I have to acknowledge, even if I didn't love the main character and I did struggle to get into it at first. Two things that usually weigh down my overall opinion quite a bit. I definitely recommend checking this one out if you haven't seen it. Thank you for watching.